77 WABC, where New York comes to talk. Good morning, Vietnam! Hey, this is not a test. This is rock and roll. Time to rock it from the Delta to the DMZ. The great Robin Williams. This is Larry Manti in for Gerardo Rivera. I, I just don't know how to feel today, you know? Robin Williams dead at the age of 63, an apparent suicide. I got the news, like many people, with news alerts over my iPhone. One of the most famous people in the world. And the world is reacting the way it is now, not only because of how he died, but when he died. Too young to get us ready for his passing, for us to say our proper goodbyes. Too late in his career for us not to love him. I want to talk about Robin Williams with you this morning because I, have, I need to talk this out. And I'm certain many of you do too. 1-866-Geraldo. 1-866-437-2536. Here's the thing. I have so many conflicting feelings about this. So many things to talk about. I mourn his loss more than anything. He was just a phenomenal talent. Unlike any we've seen before. And we may never see anybody like him ever again. I, of course, like you, was stunned by the news. But there was an anger, too, that no one's really talking about today. It is buried in the avalanche of tributes and memorials, and we need to talk about it. Suicide, to me, is a selfish way to go. He has three children from his previous marriage, from his first marriage. His second wife has two from a previous marriage. He has a substantial family that depends on him. And the number one responsibility of a father and a husband is to be there for your family and your kids. I can't imagine the heartache he has caused, the lifelong problems he has caused for his children, who now will question themselves. They'll blame themselves. I'll admit, maybe it's me. I don't understand depression. I mean, I've had bad days, bad times, but deep clinical depression, I've apparently never had it. Maybe you can explain it to me. I've been low. I've had times in my life where I felt I lost everything and I wallowed in my own situation. And those thoughts, I'll admit, creep into your mind somewhere back in a deep, dark place that maybe it would be better for everybody if you ended it all. Then you remember you have kids. What would that do to them? I could never do that to my children. So all these talking heads today are bemoaning what we lost. That's nothing compared to what Robin Williams' children have lost, what his wife has lost. You want to feel for someone today? Feel for them and what Robin Williams did to them. 1-866-Geraldo, 1-866-437-2536. That's not to say I don't admire Robin Williams and his talent, that I don't have a sympathy for the demons he battled in his life. I met him several times when I hosted Access Hollywood. I've gone to see his stand-up several times. I'm a fan. And this all shocks me that someone who attracts that much love and adulation, who has that much money and resources, can't find a way out of depression. Again, I I may not be able to understand it because I haven't been through it. I'll admit that. And maybe you can explain it to me. Maybe some of you who have battled with the same thing can explain to me what Robin Williams was going through, how someone could do this to his family. 1-866-Geraldo, 1-866-437-2536. But this ending for Robin Williams isn't an exclamation point on his brilliant career like everybody is making it out to be. It is a black mark. I think that's why his wife Susan released this statement. It is our hope the focus will not be on Robin's death, but the countless moments of joy and laughter he gave to millions. And I acknowledge that. He did give countless joy to millions. But for the people closest to him, He's caused agony. He's caused a pain that will last forever. 
Now, look, we can do that if you want. We can remember his greatness, and that's appropriate. But we should also talk about a number of other things, about depression, about suicide prevention, because maybe, just maybe, we can help somebody else. And then Robin Williams' death would also have a purpose, as much purpose, maybe, as his life did. one 866 437 Adrian in the Bronx, you're on 77 WABC. How are you? Hi, how are you? I was just listening to it, and I agree with you totally. You know, it's unfair to do this. I understand everyone has depression. We've all gone through depression. But it's unfair what he did to his family. Yeah, they're, I, they're, they're the ones who have to live with this. And again, he may have been a great man, but look how he ended. I can't, I can't appreciate what he's done because of the way he, because he showed people that this is the easy way out. There's a way out. Yeah, I hope that that's not what people learn from yeah, his but death. If you have, as as a celebrity, you you people are looking at you. People, this is what you signed up for, and this is what people now think that this is okay to do. Yeah, let's hope let's hope that's not what happens, Adrian. And I agree with you. I'll tell you what, I was I was choked up today, and and it wasn't for Robin Williams. I, I mean, I was stunned by the news last night, but I was choked up because I thought about his kids and I thought about my own kids, and what this does. And so th- that's why that's why talk radio is so important. That's why the show is so important right now because we need to talk this out. Because maybe there is somebody else out there going through the same type of demons. I, he, he apparently was bipolar. He suffered from deep depression. He had addiction. He, he had just checked himself back in to fight addiction. So he had a number of problems. But you don't do this. I, I, I can't imagine. And maybe that's the problem. I can't imagine. I can't imagine being in that dark of a place where I would hurt my kids like this. I, and I can't get past that. That's not just a hurdle. That's a wall for me that I can't get past when I talk about Robin Williams. And it's something, and I, and I did, I love the man. And it's something that, that I'm so disappointed in. And in all the adulation today, people, ju- uh, for some reason, just aren't talking about this. Gene from Brooklyn, you're in 77 WABC. Hi, Larry. Great show. Thank you. I just wanted to say, look, I, I hope... Uh, he rests in peace, and I'm, I'm very, very sorry for his family and all of us because we loved him so much. But I think we really need to find the blame, and the blame is the pharmaceutical industry, the drugs that affect our brain and the way we think. This is the problem. Just because someone is depressed does not mean you bombard them with drugs to the, bo- to the point where they're either killing themselves or doing mass murder. Yeah, Gene, it's a great point. And, you know, I just found out recently, and, and excuse me for being naive on this, but I, uh, I was doing a television show and I, I was interviewing someone, and I just found out recently that this heroin problem we're going through right now, all these kids dying from heroin and the fact that it's made a comeback, that's all on, to blame on the pharmaceutical injury right. uh, industry. And there's a really great doctor out on the West Coast, probably not far from where Robin was, Dr. Daniel Amen, and what he does, he takes uh, MRIs of the brain. He shows the defects, the holes, whether it's from, um, how you call it, for something you ate or drugs or damage from the brain, and it causes you to behave a certain way. And if you take the wrong kind of uh, prescription, it causes a, a behavior that's monstrous. All right, Gene, thank you so much for bringing that up. That's an important point. I, yeah, I can't ever get over the fact that... One of the ways to treat addiction is to say, here, take these drugs. Does does that make sense to anybody? Look, I really I really want to dive into this. I really want to understand it because I am I'm I'm so blown away that a man who seemed so happy and was so loved and had so many resources could do this. And and a little bit later. Uh, at about 10.35, we're going to talk to Keith Ablo, Dr. Keith Ablo, one of the best psychiatrists in the world. You've seen him on Fox News, and he'll help us understand this a little bit as well. But if you have been there, if you've been close, if you've been depressed, I also want to hear from you at one eight six six Geraldo. And I mean the deep, dark depression, not I'm just having a bad day. I don't want to get up today. A deep depression that's hard to get out of. 
one 437 2536 This is Larry Menti filling in for Geraldo Rivera on 77 WABC. Live and local, the Tri-State's most important issues with Geraldo, 77 WABC, where New York comes to talk. Everybody's doing cocaine. Baseball players have to go in front of a grand jury and say, yeah, I did cocaine. Can you blame me? It's a slow damn game. Come on, Jack. <laughs> I'm standing out in left field for seven innings. There's a white line going all the way down the home plate. The great Robin Williams kind of making fun of his own addiction. He had an addiction to cocaine, later to alcohol. He was still fighting that addiction up to the day that he died. This is Larry Menti filling in for Geraldo Rivera. The number to call in is one 866 1-866-437-2536. We're talking as much today here. It's not You're not hearing this most places. Here, we're talking about not only the life of Robin Williams, which was substantial, was wonderful, but his death, which I think was despicable. I, I, as a father, I can't understand. And, and again, this just might be my understanding, me internalizing it too much. But I can't forgive someone who does that to their family, to their children. Can you, can you get to that point where you're going to take your own life and cause that much pain and misery for your family? I lo- like you, I love Robin Williams, one of the most famous people in the world, a phenomenal talent. He should get those type of memorials about his life. But his death at this point is just as important because there's some people that were close to him suffering. The rest of us, oh, it's a shame. Can't believe Robin Williams is dead. But there's some people now that were close to Robin Williams. He, he's just ruined their lives. They'll be questioning themselves forever. And I don't know how someone gets to that point where they can do that to their own family, especially someone with the love and adulation and the resources that Robin Williams had. Paul from Long Island, you're in 77 WABC. Hey, how you doing? Hi, I'm, how you doing, Paul? Um, I'm good. I just wanted to say that um, suicide is not something that I don't think anybody could really understand. And you're not going to understand it until you actually get to the point where you're actually going to complete your suicide. And I did this uh, several weeks ago, and I actually succeeded, and I was dead, and then I was brought back. What did you do, uh, Paul? How did you kill yourself? I took a quantity of pills that I had that were prescribed to me. But I want to say, because somebody called in and said something about the pharmaceutical industry being uh, the reason or the cause, and that's not true, because you can kill yourself with anything. Yeah, no, I don't think that she was, I don't think she was saying that it's the pharmaceutical, that that the pharmaceutical is providing the method. They're just exacerbating the problem. I think that's what she was saying. But Paul, I want to talk about your situation for one second. You don't don't need to get into too much detail, but how did you get to that point what was going on that got you to that point where you, you wanted to kill yourself? My issue was the loss in my life. I've had so many uh, experiences with with losing things that I had uh, I felt value about, um, love, uh, relationships, children, you know, just, you know, uh, people in my life like parents, you know, losing and losing, just a whole life of losing and you know, I experienced yet another loss, and I just didn't want to deal with that depression. And what was the one that put you over the edge? What was the final loss? You said there was uh, one more. The The final loss was that I was in a, a long-term relationship, and it just ended abruptly. All right, now, this is important, Paul. Were you trying to get back at that person? Not at all. In because fact, you know that would they would have to live with that the rest of their lives. No, it wasn't about uh, a revenge. Um, it, it was about the loss. I didn't want to experience the depression that I felt when I went through a loss before because I've experienced it so many times, and you just never get used to it. So you wanted the pain and to go away. I wanted the pain to get, go away. And what's most important about this and what people should understand is you lose your character when you do this. You're not who you, 
who you people know who you are. You, you're somebody else. When I did it, I didn't even realize that I was taking the pills. When I came, when they brought me back and I started to come around, I asked them what happened. And they said, well, you took pills. And I said, I, I only remember taking one. So you became another person that had the capability of killing themselves, but you yeah. yourself, Paul, the person That's you are most of the time, could not have yeah. done that. It's almost, that's correct, because, you know, and people say, oh, it's such an easy way out. Okay, if it's so easy, why aren't more people doing it? It's not easy. Think about it. You just said yourself, I could never do it. I think about my kids, I could never do it. It's, it's difficult to do. Yeah, but you, I uh, uh, you're mis- you misunderstood do. me. There might have been points in my life where I could do that for myself. I couldn't do that to someone else. And I realized as much as pain as I was feeling, Paul, I didn't want to inflict that pain on people that I loved. And did you ever feel that? I, I did. But like I said before, you know, your, your point is understandable. But like I said before, you become somebody else. When they talk about Robin Williams and his demons, you know, that's exactly what happens. These demons, they take over. Your mind becomes just completely somebody else. Maybe it's like a, a schizophrenia or something. You just you shut down and you go into this auto mode and your body is just doing these things and you're not even realizing what's going on and you just do it. Paul, are you OK now? I'm getting the help that I need to get better and to get back on track. And you don't have those thoughts anymore? I don't have those thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm in therapy and I'm, I'm working out my, my issues and I'm trying to gain the confidence and, uh, you know, motivate myself to be better and to, you know, not do this again. And what, I'm, what, what I have a fear about is that when you get over the fear of something, it becomes that much easier to do again. All right, Paul, look, uh, thank you so much for calling in and having the courage to call in and talk about this. I think you calling in was very important and could help a lot of people. And this is a perfect time to pass along this phone number. This is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The number to call in is 1-800-273-8255. Again, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. There are people who would help you. This is Larry Menti filling in for Gerardo Rivera on 77 WABC. New York's biggest issues right now. This is Geraldo, 77 WABC. This is Larry Menti filling in for Gerardo Rivera on 77 WABC. We've been grappling with the death of Robin Williams, trying to understand how someone that adored, that loved, Seemingly that happy, first of all, could hide his demons this well for all of those years. But then how could he take his own life? Uh, There's been a lot of talk this morning, uh, adulation about Robin Williams, looking back at his career and all of it well-deserved. But we also need to talk about his death, which, which I don't believe is an exclamation point on a brilliant career. I think it's a black mark on a brilliant, brilliant career. And as I've been saying this morning, I, I don't understand how someone could do that to his family. But then again, I don't understand and have never had, apparently, clinical depression. I felt depressed, but I know that clinical depression is something different. So... To help us figure that out, to help me figure that out, I want to talk to Dr. Keith Ablo, who is one of America's leading psychiatrists. You've seen him many times on Fox News. Doctors, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Tell, tell me what I'm not getting about this. Here's the thing, and, and uh, it's a quick trip to understanding, because major depression steals your vision of the future. It's always irrational. It's essentially delusional, major depression. It makes you believe that life is airless and without exit, and that there can be no good event unfolding in your life, that there isn't going to be any sunshine. And I've had people tell me when they look at pictures of their kids when they're depressed, listen, I hate to tell you this, Doc, but I don't feel anything. I don't feel connected to these people at all. That's what we're dealing with here. So it's not like a bad day. It's not a bad month. 
it's blackness, and you need to fight a war against it to have a chance of overcoming it. Now, when you heard the story about Robin Williams and what he's been going through his whole life, do you think, like other people that are, are great psychiatrists might think, if, if only I could have had a, a talk to him, if only I could have treated him, would, would, was there help for Robin Williams? I mean, I can't imagine he didn't get it. He had all the resources in the world. I know. Well, listen, sure. You know, some of us have that feeling. Like, I, I wish I could have reached into that abyss with him because I know that there aren't that many psychiatrists or therapists who are really willing to deploy every weapon at our disposal, which are many, and which generally work in service to getting people out of this illness, right? Most people exercise restraint for some reason. Most is, clinicians, they just won't go there. And is there a problem when you have someone that's that famous that many doctors might be intimidated by that person and defer sure. to them? Listen, I treated an ex-cabinet member. I hospitalized him against his will four times. In order to do that, I had to decide that I could give not at all to blanks uh, the fact that he had served in multiple administrations. I was wholly focused on the fact that I'm keeping the guy on the planet. I don't care that he's enraged with me at the moment where the ambulance and the police take him to the locked psychiatric unit. Sure, if you don't have that kind of resolute vision that there's no way you're going to ruin my record, dude, of keeping people on the planet, then you're vulnerable because you can be cajoled into not doing enough. You can you can be tentative in your approach, which is, ah, it, and he, it, it's hell. And, and he's always going to go to doctors he likes. I mean, he, he, does, he doesn't have to have a doctor. If a doctor's giving him news he doesn't like, he can go to somebody else. Like, I'm not going to lay this all on the feet of the physicians. It can also be him just choosing sure. the wrong path. Look, you know, I mean, it's going to be looking for a needle in a haystack to say I'm going to go find a doctor who, despite my being a world-famous actor and comedian and having incredible resources, is going to get my family to file in the local district court uh, for uh, guardianship over me. We're right? talking to that Dr. Kate. Sorry, right. doctor. It takes a whole different perspective. Yeah, I'm talking to Dr. Keith Abloh from Fox News, one of America's leading psychiatrists. And uh, I'm still, you, you know, you can't see beyond your own understanding many times. And, and I still don't get to that point where I can see hurting your family that much by committing suicide. The people I feel today for the most are the family of yes. Robin Williams and what they have to go through and his children, what they have to go through the rest of their lives. But we had a call just a moment ago, and I don't know if you heard it, but it was a, a guy named Paul from Long Island who called in who actually committed suicide and had to be brought back. And he said when he came to, he said what happened. He didn't remember taking his own life. He says he became someone else. Yes. I, I, look, sure, I think you can be that delusional that you literally feel as though you're someone else. But also, people believe at these moments that, listen, the world would be better off without me. I'm a burden to my family. I've done horrible things. None of this being true, by the way. But that's what depression does. It empties you out so that you think, oh, who's gonna, there's nobody who's going to miss me any, anyhow. I'm not hurting anybody. So it's no different than if you were felled by a cardiac event. Your brain was under siege by this horrible illness. Uh, it, it was also wrapped around your life story, and maybe it had roots in trauma that you suffered as a kid or other kinds of pain. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, you didn't see another couple pages of your life story unfolding. And, and testimony to that fact is the fact, listen, I said to patients, hey, if you feel like there's nothing left, they say freedom is having nothing left to lose. You're free to do anything. You want to walk out on your marriage? You want to live in Aruba and be a bartender? Go do it. It's better than taking your life. Now, sometimes that will help people say, huh, okay, well, that's true, so I'll stick it out. I'll stick it out. What are we going to do next? And what you have to do next is say, we're going to attack this with medicine, with technology, because there is, there's ketamine infusions, there's transcranial magnetic stimulation, all these wonderful tools, but we got to pull the trigger on it. 
All right, Dr. Keith Ablo, I appreciate your time so much. I know this is a busy day for you. I know every day is a busy day, but today well, especially. Well, thanks for having me on, man. I and, appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you for taking the time, and we'll see you later today on Fox News. I appreciate it. You all, bye-bye. That was Dr. Keith Ablo giving us some understanding into clinical depression, the kind of depression that took the life of, well, I don't want to say that. He took his own life. Clinical depression was there and contributed but he still made the decision to take his own life. Robin Williams, I'm talking about. I'm having a t- hard time, as you've been able to hear, forgiving him for that. I, I, I think you can separate the two. I think you can separate his life and his death and talk about the both of them separately. One that was wonderful and one that's unforgivable, especially for his family. I want to talk to you about this. Help, help us all get through this together. 1-866-Geraldo, 1-866-437-2536. This is Larry Menti filling in for Geraldo Rivera on 77 WABC. The sound of the city, Geraldo, where New York comes to talk. 77 WABC. You feel like you're alone, Will? Do you have a soulmate? Define that. Somebody who challenges you, touches your soul. I got plenty. Well, name them. Shakespeare, Nietzsche, Frost, O'Connor, Kant, Pope, Locke. That's great. They're all dead. That's the great Robin Williams from Goodwill Hunting, the performance he won an Oscar for. This is Larry Menti filling in for Gerardo Rivera. We're celebrating the life of Robin Williams, but trying to understand his death, something that I don't get at all. I don't understand how anyone, especially someone, as loved as Robin Williams, with the resources of Robin Williams, could take his own life and do that to the ones he loved, could hurt his family like that. I think it's something that we're talking about here, but it's not being talked about today. We have to watch out that when we adulate this man, we don't adulate the way he died. That we make certain, we say, no, 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 that's wrong. You don't do that to your family. Or try to understand it. How can you get to that point and prevent it? By the way, the Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. Barbara in New Jersey, you're on 77 WABC. Barbara? Hi, Barbara, you're on. Hi, Um, I tried to commit suicide twice. The first time I did it, I lost my son. Um, He died all of a sudden of uh, walking pneumonia. I was talking to him 10 o'clock at night. 4 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from the police. They found him dead in his car. And um, he died on my birthday. Oh, my God. Um. Yeah, Barbara, you know, as I was saying a moment ago, how I don't understand how someone could take their own life. I also don't understand, although I've seen it too many times, I've seen the pain that losing a child can cause. And so my understanding, uh, my lack of understanding about suicide, I do understand how if I lost a child, I might get to that point. Was you, was it your only child? No, I have I have two other daughters, but it was just sudden. It was just, you know, I'm talking to him 10:30 in the morning. I'll see you tomorrow. Love you, hon. And he said, "Love you, mom." And the next phone call I get is from the police. And who are you? And I'm Nikki's mother. And who are you? on the police and I thought oh my god they arrested my son and I couldn't figure out for what and the guy says we found your son dead in the parking lot how Uh, long after that moment did you try to take your own life uh, I'd say about a month and so you battled with a deep depression for a long for a month for well probably longer than that but it was okay hold on that's that's an important part so you had problems before this that you were dealing with before the loss of your son and that was just what put you over the edge i had problems with my when i remarried and had a second husband because he didn't like my son because my son was very close to me 
and um, he, he, you know, he just didn't like my son. He'd always say, you know. Right. I know. I, but here's what I, here's what I don't understand. You have two other children. Did you think at the time, by the way, how did you try to kill yourself? With my medicine, I was taking my pills because I take Xanax and I take Enderol and I take uh, medicine because I have a tumor on my brain. So you purposely um, tried to overdose. Did you think of your two other children? I didn't think of anybody but my son. I thought, I'm going to take these and I'm going to go see my son. That's what I thought. Well, Barbara, uh, again, I thank you so much for the courage to call. Now, you tried to commit suicide a second time. What what happened that time? Well, the second time, I told you I married, uh, I'm married for the second time. And um, over the last five years, um, my husband and I have been living together like roommates. Um, there's no emotional uh, feelings. Um, I... We have our own bedrooms. Um, I get a kiss in the morning goodbye and a kiss hello when he comes home from work. Uh, we sit and watch TV together. We don't hold hands. He doesn't hug me. He doesn't... Nothing. And it's this just... push you to trying to take your life again? Yeah. I'm so Barbara, alone. I hope you're getting help. If, I if, if that... I mean, I can understand alone. the first one. I know. I get it. Uh, but please... Please get help because um, you're from everything you've described, you're going through way too much to handle this alone. I appreciate you calling in so we can kind of understand what pushes somebody to that point. But you need help. This is Larry Menti filling in for Gerardo Rivera on 77 WABC. He started here. He is here. No one knows New York better. Geraldo. 77 WABC, where New York comes to talk. Now, you've done it, right? I was, uh, one year I was one of three hosts. It was uh, Alan Alda and Jane Fonda, which, they're some funny people. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, if you want to riff, those are the people you'd pick. Well, now. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a gig where the moment you're out there, you know, you see just people and you'd look out and you'd see Gregory Peck looking at you like, you're not going to grab yourself, are you, Mr. <laughs> Did you have a temptation? Yeah, you wanted to go, Yo, Gregory! <laughs> What about these, baby? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Robin Williams talking with Conan O'Brien about hosting the Oscars. This is Larry Menti filling in for Geraldo Rivera. He was phenomenally talented and phenomenally funny. And we, are, are, we all miss him today. There is no question we miss Geraldo Rivera. But you know who really misses him? Is his family. Could you? I can't even imagine having someone that close to me, a parent, a a spouse, taking their own lives, you would have to live the rest of your life with the torment of that. And that's what I can't get over. And I'm trying to separate his life, which is being everybody's heralding today, everybody's talking about today. I'm trying to separate that from his death, which is unforgivable. I know we've talked about depression and we've talked about people who have got we've talked with people who got to that point where they felt like they needed to end it all and why they did. And some the one woman who who lost her son, I I, believe me, if, if I lost one of my children, I could get to that point very easily. Someone else said that they they had actually taken their own lives and was were brought back. And that person said, you become someone else. You don't even remember you did it. But still, I I, I can't, even when you go to that deep, dark place, even when you become someone else, you don't think about the people you love. You don't pull yourself back from that place and say, I can't do this because I'm going to hurt so many other people. Forget my own pain. I can't cause that pain to someone I love more than myself. I just don't understand it. And I'm trying to understand it along with you. Shirley from Yonkers, you're on 77 WABC. Yes, good morning, Larry. Um, I just had something I wanted to say. I lost my son to suicide. Shirley, I am so 
Sorry. Yeah, but li- this is important, you know, the people that listen or whatever. The comfort you can get in one respect is that people that commit suicide, my son or Robin Williams or whatever, at that moment that their pain or whatever takes over, at that moment they are not thinking. They're not, I mean, the, 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 the loved ones that they leave behind is not in their thought. I mean, there is no thought there. It's just that they're succumbing to a pain at that moment because if they had the time to think about the loved ones they're leaving behind, they would still be here. So you're saying it doesn't build to that moment. It is, it's quick. That's they, right. They want, something happens and they feel like they although everybody I've talked to, they've said it's build. You know, you know it's, for instance, the woman that lost her son, it took a month after she lost her son. Uh, someone else called and said they committed suicide and it took a long time. So Shirley, I ask you this, is, mm-hmm. is this just what you think so you can cope with this? No. No, it's not because I I realize I mean I'm not I, I don't I'm not maybe I'm losing what you're saying now I'm not saying that my son uh, over a period of time was not going through depression uh, to reach that point what I'm saying is at that moment that he took his life he was not thinking at all so loved ones that's being left behind whether it was him robin williams or whatever they are not thinking that at the moment and that's why i you know i never had any guilt about about uh that because for that reason i understand that because you know my son was very very loving person and had he thought oh look what i'm gonna do to mom i can't do this that never came into play it never came into play. So you are you you have found some type of peace with this? Yes, I have. And that's the peace that it wasn't this that, that, when your son took his life, he didn't do this to you. Right, exactly. And did not mean to do it to himself. It was just I believe at that moment with any of them uh that that are overwhelmed, so overwhelmed that at that moment they do this. It's just a spontaneous thing at that at that moment. And, and forgive it, the question, Shirley, but do you blame yourself at all? No, not at all. We had a very loving relationship, uh, uh, and I was always there for him, and that's the comfort that I take. Maybe the only thing that I may feel is that I wasn't there at that moment, that maybe I could have done something, but other than that, no. All right, Shirley, thank you so much. It's such an important perspective to get today as we try to understand. 77 WABC, where New York comes to talk. It is the day after we all got the news about Robin Williams apparently taking his own life at the age of 63. He has three children from a previous marriage, two children that he, that his second wife brought to the marriage with her. So five children all together, and he took his own life. And my thoughts today, as much as they are with Robin Williams' career and how much laughter he brought to the world, are with those loved ones, are with his family. Because I have a difficult time letting that go, that someone could be that selfish, could get to the point in their lives where they would cause that much pain to their family, regardless of what pain they're feeling, that they would cause that much pain to their family. I personally couldn't do that. But that's why why talk radio is so important. We have been expanding our understanding for the last hour and a half because people are calling and sharing their own experiences. And when we hear from others, we gain understanding. Janet from Brooklyn. You're on 77 WABC. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I hope that I could uh, uh, put some understanding to this matter. I, too, have bipolar disorder. I've been suffering for close to 15 years. And I have a wonderful family, friends, four wonderful children. And I, too, have attempted to commit suicide. And more than one time, I, too, actually died and was revived 
And uh, when I awoke in ICU, I was not a happy camper. What happens in your life when you get to that point and you decide you want to take your own life? By me, it wasn't about what happened per se in my life. Bipolar disorder is a very, very painful illness. So there was no event. There was no event that triggered this. It was just. I, listen, I had I've had a hard life. I've had I I, I have been uh, abused. I had a difficult marriage, but none of those things are why each of the times I tried to commit suicide. None of those things were the the trigger at that moment. I, I it, you're right. You really can't understand what it's like unless you you personally have. Lived it. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to understand, Janet. And that's why I'm so. Let me just let me ask you one question, then I'll get on to the depression. How do you think of other people at that point? Do you you said you have a loving family? Do you think of the other people? The only thing I think about is that I actually I do think of my kids, and I think my kids will be better off without me. They'll have to manage somehow. They'll manage. I don't forget. I never forget about my kids. And now, by this point, thankfully, I'm, I'm much healthier. And and I still do think of killing myself at times, but at this point I'm I'm I know how to reach out for help, and in the end the reason I don't is because of my kids. But but back then I'm talking more like eight ten years ago I wasn't I didn't have as much you know support, and I didn't know what to do with all these strong feelings. So I did I went ahead and I. And I how you know, old so. were your kids when you attempted this? <sighs> my youngest was about. Four, I have four children. They were probably aged four to eight or so. Uh, eight, the eight-year-old then, eight or nine, would have some understanding of what happened. What was the reaction? They didn't know that I, they, to this day, don't know that I tried to kill myself. They, I mean, they, they I've been in, in that hospital about 30 times. They know that I'm bipolar. They know that I take, you know, mountains of medication. I was an extremely high-functioning person until... The bipolar really set in. I'm doing much better now, but there were many years I couldn't function at all. I couldn't take care of them at all. Janet, I, I, I do thank you so much for calling in and giving that perspective. Again, we are broadening our understanding of suicide, depression, and bipolar. And Robin Williams had both bipolar disorder and depression that he was, he was trying to fight. Uh, this is Larry Menti on 77 WABC. The number to call in is 1-866-HERALDO, 1-866-437-2536. Together, we're trying to make it through this, to, to try to understand. Not, not that it affects our lives so much. I mean, you go, oh, Robin Williams is gone. Not that it affects our lives so much. Uh, and we get to celebrate his life. But just trying to understand What brings a person to that point where they could take their own life and affect their family so much? 1-866-HERADO, 1-866-437-2536. We've had incredibly compelling phone calls until this point. We have incredibly compelling phone calls to come as we try to understand this together. Larry Menti in for Gerardo Rivera. On 77 WABC. Geraldo, live, local. Today's most important New York stories, only on 77 WABC. I'm sorry to anyone in our studio audience uh, that that I'm uh, breaking this news. This is absolutely uh, shocking and, and, and horrifying and so upsetting on every level. That was Conan O'Brien announcing to his audience last night that Robin Williams had died, committed suicide, apparently, at the age of 63, leaving a family behind. And, and all the accolades today, all the glowing accolades are deserved. He was a phenomenal talent. We may never see another talent like Robin Williams. He's one of the most famous people in the world. Today, we're separating that for the moment from his death, which was non-phenomenal, unfortunately, which was unforgivable, which caused great pain to his family 
And and together we are trying to understand, and, and we've had some amazing phone calls, trying to understand what brings a person to that point, a person with every resource, all the money in the world, all the love in the world. What brings a person to that point where they can take their own lives and cause that much pain to others? He had demons that he was hiding all of his life. He was bipolar. He had addiction, first to cocaine and then to alcohol. He had deep clinical depression. And he was fighting all of that all the time that we were laughing. He was hurting inside. He felt this pain his whole life, and apparently he couldn't take it anymore. But when you have a family and you have children, at least it's hard to understand beyond your own experience. But at least with me, I could never, I don't care what happened to me. Unless I lost my family, I could not get to the point where I could take my own life and be that selfish and hurt my family. But depression is something I guess you have to go through to understand. And and there's so many of these comedians, so many, I guess, actors, but, but comedians especially. I talked about a friend of our family's, Richard Jenny, who killed himself. And, and so many are, are dealing with depression and we never see it. For instance... Did you know David Letterman was dealing with deep, deep depression? And as we try to understand this, I want you to listen to his words because he he separates clinical depression from what it's like to just feeling down for a day. I never knew what depression was. I knew what, oh, I'm kind of sad today. Oh, I'm kind of blue today. Oh, geez, the red's lost. I knew that. Mm -hmm. This, I'm telling you, is you get on an elevator and the bottom drops out. And you, 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 you can't stand looking at the sunlight. Uh, you, you can't wait to get back in bed at night. Uh, you, 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 you're shaking. You're, you're shivering. And I went through this for about six months. And, oh, my God. How were you able to work every day being depressed? I, I just pushed through it. Pushed through it? I had to push through it. Could you uh, be funny? Well, as funny as you can when you're depressed. But mm-hmm. uh, it's a sinkhole. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and people who have gone through it know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a sinkhole. And, and maybe that's it. You know, you know, you see these people, unless you go through it, you don't know what it's about. But if he can push through, if he can push through to work and he can push through to try to be funny, why can't you push through for your family, which should be number one on that list? That's what I'm having a hard time with. That's what I'm trying to understand. Kay from Manhattan, you're on 77 WABC. Hi, um, thank you for taking my call. I want to talk about, um, I understand you said that depression hurts others and that killing yourself, suicide hurts others, but depression is like any other illness. First of all, Kay, uh, since you're putting words in my mouth, I, I want to—I didn't say depression hurts others. I said oh, that suicide hurts others. Oh, I'm so, so, so sorry. Yeah, that's okay. But I'm saying, but depression is it's like any other illness. It's like if you have cancer and it's killing you and hurting you, only you know that pain. It's very unique to you. And I think it's very unselfish to take yourself out without hurting other people. Because we, we all know about this rap, rampant thing of people doing suicide attacks or killing themselves, killing their kids, killing whole communities, shooting people. If you kill yourself because you can't deal with the pain of your own pain. It's your own personal pain. No one else is feeling it. No, there's other people involved, and that's the problem I have. You just put your – in trying to make the other point, you just put your finger on the problem that I have, that people are so – oh, I'm feeling so much pain, I have to take my own life and don't think about anybody else. No, they're thinking about other people because they're not hurting anybody else. Oh, they are deeply hurting other people. But but their pain is like a cancer. It's like a, a, a bad limb. Yeah, which they're trying to take out. I get that. I just, I think that you are so involved in yourself at that moment that you're not thinking of the collateral damage. Margaret from New York, you're on 77 WABC. Larry, you have a great show, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate you doing this today. Um, I, um, in my family, we uh, suffered a suicide. My stepfather, who was 73 years old, He committed suicide, um, went down to the basement and shot himself. Uh, He had stroke before that, Larry. And they put him on all kinds of medications. He said he felt 
He was never the same. He was 34 years in the New York City Fire Department, saved people's lives throughout, never skipped a beat. And I'm telling you, Larry, he saved a lot of people's lives, but couldn't save his own life at the end. He was so into depression, and we knew it. He, he didn't feel the same. He kept saying it. I had recovered from heart surgery myself back in 2001. Uh, I had a, uh, a triple bypass in 2001. And for the first time, for three months, Larry, I was in depression, not suicidal, but I could not go out of my house. Yeah. And I knew I had to get off of these drugs they were putting me on. Oh, that's a great yeah. point. Margaret, I want to I want to comment on one thing yeah. that you said, and, and it's so important that you brought this up. Mm-hmm. One of the deep, dark secrets in every city is the number of suicides of yeah. firefighters and police officers. And we have to deal with that a whole lot more than we have been. Instead of burying it in the cellar instead of instead of and I and excuse me for saying cellar because I understand I what know. happened with with but that's what the city is doing the city is trying to hide this and push it away and it happens in every police department and it's something that we have to be forward thinking on and treat these people who are you know Robin Williams this is what I hope happens with the discussion we're having right now that we can start talking about depression and suicide and take it out of the darkness and so that people know that there are people out there that love them and care about them and no matter what they went through in their lives like a firefighter like your stepfather or a police officer or a first responder or a soldier coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who may have seen horrible things who, by the way, have lived much rougher lives than Robin Williams, who may be going through depression and wanting to kill themselves, that there's people there for them and there are resources there for them. I want to ask you one last question before before you go, Margaret. And what did, do, what did this do to your family? Well, I'm going to tell you, it was a stigma. And my mom, who was in her 70s at the time, and she's still alive today, she cried out. And I didn't know what to do with her. I mean, it was day after day. And why, why, they ask. And it's like you're just trying to love that person through it. And she loved this man very much. She didn't see this coming. 22 years of marriage, and it just it ended in one fell swoop with a note, a goodbye note. I mean, he had presence of mind to leave a, a note, you know, basically, and that was it. Did, did she ever get over it? You never get over it. You always, you know what, Larry, you try to help other people. It, whether it's in church or whatever, you try to help the next person. And i got to tell you one other thing. I don't mean to be a downer here. My husband just went through heart surgery um, in New York Presbyterian Hospital on uh, July 7th. Great hospital. But he went through a triple bypass like me. And he's now, and, and this is why I want to I just make you learn, just feel this for, with me with a minute. He also had to go through dialysis now three times a week. So I asked him yesterday when Mark Levin uh, let this out, this out last night at 7 o'clock, I said, uh, I was picking him up by dialysis, and I said, I said to my husband, I love you, and we're going to get through this. Yeah, that's what a lot of people need is just that. Margaret, w- what a great phone call, and thank you so much for calling and sharing that. But did you hear what she said? You never get over it. A- and her mother crying and and crying endlessly for months and months and months. That's what Robin Williams' family is going through right now. And that's what he didn't think out. And that's what I'm trying to understand. Not just his life, but his death. And, and how someone that successful gets to this point. one 866 1-866-437-2536. This is Larry Menti filling in for Gerardo Rivera on 77 WABC. Get Geraldo now. Get in on New York's most important stories. 866 Geraldo, 77 WABC. This is Larry Menti filling in for Geraldo Rivera. What a positive experience today has been in the wake of tragedy, in the wake of the apparent suicide of Robin Williams at the age of 63. If you did not have a chance to listen to the last couple of hours, please go online to 77wabc.com and listen to the podcast because if you are trying to come to grips with a man who is this successful in his life 
and has so much to live for and so many resources to beat any demons. If you're trying to, trying to figure out how he could take his own life and cause so much pain to his family, so much pain to the people he loves, then the last two hours will give you some understanding. That podcast will give you some understanding because people have called in and have shared their experience with depression. People that have committed suicide and have been brought back to life. And people who have dealt with bipolar disorder have called in and explained to me and broadened my horizons because I don't get it. And I started off the show by saying that I don't get it. But now I have a little bit of a better understanding. Jackie from New Jersey, you're on 77 WABC. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, I'm a registered nurse and I'm a mother of four kids. They are all healthy. I have a husband and I suffered off and on from bouts of clinical depression that were very severe. At one point when my children were very young, I did uh, try to commit suicide. It was a very near miss. I'm very fortunate that I survived that attempt. Jackie, Uh, let me ask you the question there. How could you do that with kids? Because I I was in a different place. Um, As a nurse and having also gone through this personally and from all your previous callers, I was not healthy. Uh, Depression is an illness of the brain, and when the brain chemistry is off, your thinking is off, and that is one of the symptoms of depression is that you are not thinking the way that you rationally do. Uh, Today, I'm healthy. I take precautions. Uh, I have grandchildren now, but at the time, there was a lot of stigma involved in depression, and I felt that I was a burden to my husband and my children, and I felt that they would be ashamed of me, and that I was holding them back in their lives, and that even though it would be sad for them to lose me, I felt that their lives would be better. I know, Jackie, and thank you, and I'm sorry that I cut you off there, but uh, uh, you raised an important point. And in that, we're trying to put rational thought to the irrational. We're trying to understand something that may not be understandable. And thank goodness, Jackie, that you were able to to come back from this. Thank goodness that you were able to fight this. What, what a wonderful experience this has been for me. Thank you for sharing it with me. And thank you for calling in. And thank you for explaining and sharing your experiences. Many people had, had to have the courage to call in. Curtis and Kubi are up next, and I'm sure they're going to be talking much more about this, as we might be talking about for some time to come, the death of Robin Williams and how somebody can get to that point with all those resources. This is Larry Manti filling in for Gerardo Rivera on 77 WABC. I will talk to you again tomorrow.